Hi, my name is Todd Horton and I'm here to talk about how survey grade GPS works. In the end of the second part of this series, we talked about errors. And the first error we spoke of was clock synchronization error. As we delve into further errors, it's important to understand that the proper application of any measurement method requires that you know the inherent error sources for that method. So beyond clock synchronization error with GNSS systems, we need to understand orbital error. That is the difference between predicted trajectories and as-flown trajectories. Further, the dilution of precision is a predictor of expected positional quality. Not only does the troposphere affect GPS signals, but the ionosphere especially induces an error that we must account for. Multipath error is caused by conditions on the ground near our receiver, and we must understand the impact of those. The satellite trajectories are mathematically defined. Physical forces, that is, magnetic influences from the sun and gravitational influences from the earth, cause the satellites to drift from their calculated trajectories. The International GNSS Service is a consortium of member nations whose GNSS tracking sites are shown on this map. They collect as flown positions of the satellites, which will be different from their predicted satellites. Why? Well, one is variations in the Earth's gravitational field from place to place, and second are the magnetic forces placed on the satellites by the influence of the Sun. The predicted orbits, also known by that term ephemeris, the predicted orbits have an accuracy of about one meter. However, because of the physical forces experienced by the satellites, the satellites drift from that. We need to track that so we can update those satellite orbital trajectories. Therefore, if we wait about six hours after the satellites have gone overhead, the IGS can provide what they call their ultra-rapid ephemeris, which then tells us the position of the satellite to within five centimeters. Wait another seven hours on average, and we can squeeze that down by a factor of two. Now we know the position of the satellite to the nearest two and a half centimeters, or the nearest inch. If we wait 12 to 14 days, then we can combine our data with data from the Russian satellite constellation known as GLONASS. This as-flown data then becomes the basis for updating the predicted satellite trajectories. Dilution of precision is an indicator of expected positional quality. So if we're doing surveying during periods of high dilution of precision, we will see less accurate positions than during periods of low dilution of precision. Consider that precision is a good thing, but if we dilute our precision, then we're doing a bad thing. When dilution of precision is high, accuracy goes down. Dilution of precision can be explained in multiple ways, and the two most common that you'll see are what we call GDOP, or geometric dilution of precision, or PDOP, positional dilution of precision. These are useful for describing the three-dimensional quality of the position, but for surveying applications, it's common to split those up into horizontal and vertical dilution of precision. Good positional dilution of precision occurs when satellites are scattered widely across the dome of the sky, some of them overhead, some near the horizon. I want you to think of a three-dimensional shape that is like a diamond, and the point of this diamond 
is at the receiver. And the, the top of the diamond is the multiple facets that you see here, triangular planes that connect groups of three satellites. When the volume of this diamond is high, then we have good positional dilution of precision. However, we can have poor dilution, positional dilution of precision when we have a low volume. Well, that low volume can be caused when we have our satellites bunched up in the sky directly overhead. And not only is our positional dilution of precision poor, but our horizontal dilution of precision is poor. But what could we say about our vertical dilution of precision? Well, this could be very good vertical dilution of precision because we have redundancy in the vertical lines that establish the vertical position of our receiver. By contrast, here we have a poor vertical dilution of precision when our satellites are scattered to the horizon, but we have none overhead. Again, we have a low volume of this three-dimensional shape. So, but here, we can have good horizontal dilution of precision because most of the lines that we are measuring from the satellites are fairly close to the horizontal plane. Dilution of precision is constantly changing. Why? Well, the satellites are moving. And in one of the previous videos, you saw how the satellite positions do not stay in a rigid formation as they streak across the sky. Satellites are rising and setting. When our positional dilution of precision is less than three, we can expect very good results. When it exceeds that, then we can expect problems with our positional quality. Atmospheric delay is one of the most significant errors that we deal with in GPS positioning. Let's consider the travel of the signal through the vacuum of space. For that first 12,500 miles, it's pretty much undisturbed. But once it reaches the ionosphere, the signal gets delayed and, and dithered with and degraded. And any lengthening of the travel time from the satellite to the receiver will give us erroneous results. To minimize the effect of the ionosphere on our data, we apply a thing we call an elevation mask. When a satellite is directly overhead, its signal passes through the ionosphere and the troposphere by the shortest possible path. But when the satellite is out on the horizon, then the signal has to slice through the troposphere and the ionosphere by the longest possible path. Thus, that signal will experience far more degradation than the signal coming from overhead. So we set the elevation mask, that is a setting in your receiver, to anywhere between 10 degrees and 15 degrees. When the satellite is below this line, this, this surface, the receiver does not accept its data. Once it rises above that surface, then we listen to the data and include it in the solution. This simply prevents corrupted data from being combined with good data. Multipath error is also very significant. We have to be careful uh, around buildings especially. What happens? Well, when when we're receiving signals here, we may, we will get signals directly from the satellites, but other signals will reflect off of those vertical surfaces and give us bad data. Not only do buildings cause this, but things that you might not expect, such as water, a horizontal water surface will reflect a signal. 
Likewise, chain link fences. You and I can see through those chain link fences, but they are reflective just as a steel wall is reflective to the GPS signals. So we've looked at orbital error, atmospheric error, clock synchronization error, and multipath error. So let me ask you a question. Is GNSS surveying more accurate than other surveying methods? Well, not necessarily. You see, all measurements contain error. It's our role as professionals to understand the inherent error sources so that we can match the tool to the task. GNSS surveying allows us to do some pretty amazing things. It is good for many tasks and not so good for others. Site conditions and system conditions can degrade GNSS position quality below an acceptable level. Match the tool to the task.